All right, hello everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of A Sip of Knowledge with Marty Duffy, Liz Rhodes, and Lou Bryson. Plus this week, Gordon Dundas of Ian McLeod Distillers. I'm gonna let your host give a more formal introduction to Gordon in just a few minutes. Real quick before I turn things over, I'm Will Huckinga from Zavi.co, and as always, just want to point out a few ways that you can interact with one another, send in questions for your hosts and their guests and things like that throughout the show today. So on your right, you'll see a chat box. Feel free to give us a little wave, say hello, let us know where you're joining us from around the world. Uh, if you do have a specific question for any of your hosts or for Gordon during the show, there's a little button at the bottom of the screen that says ask a question. So just click that button, type your question in. I'll be keeping an eye out for those throughout the show today. And last but not least, feel free to invite your friends to join us. There's a share button at the top that makes it really easy to do that. But with all that out of the way, uh, Marty, Liz Lou, the floor is yours now. Thanks there, Will. Hey, you know, I was standing out in a field the other day when all of a sudden a giant eagle came down, swooped up a little frog. And I thought, oh, my God, that frog's going to probably die. But no, no, the frog was alive inside that eagle. And he's making his way through the eagle. He's kind of pushing his way. He's going through the digestive tract of the eagle. Just making his way. Going all the way. And he can see a little, some glimmering light. So he's making his way towards the light. He's going. He's moving his way. Turns out it's the eagle's butthole. So he goes to the eagle's butthole. And he's looking out. And he goes, oh, my God. He's, I'm about to escape from the eagle through his butthole. And he goes. And he goes, oh, my God. He looked out. And he's way, way far up. So he shouts out through the butthole. He goes, Eagle, Eagle, how, how far up are we? And he, the Eagle goes, he could speak Eagle, obviously. He goes, <laughs> Eagle, how far up are we? And he goes, oh, about two miles. And he goes, you ain't shit me, are you? Art, 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 art. <laughs> That's a true story. One of your better ones. One Thank of your you better ones. Much. <laughs> Well, Hi, some everyone. Things, some things never change, Marty. Good to see you, my friend. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Martin Duffy. I am a former senior master of whiskey for Diageo. I uh, spent 14 glorious years there, uh, followed by uh, 18 inglorious months as the uh, national brand ambassador for Benedictine, uh, followed by eight... Days. Um, very uh, rewarding years as the uh, co-producer of the Chicago Independent Spirit Expo, uh, followed by or actually overlapping with uh, uh, seven and a half years as the sole brand representative of Glen Cairn Crystal in all of North America, probably Central America and South America as far as I know. Well, and just cool. finished uh, mapping out the Atlas of the World. <laughs> just finished that. Guy needs week. a hobby. Somebody had somebody had to do it. I did it. <laughs> so there you go, Lizard. Hey everyone, thanks, Marty. Um, chairs. Ch chairs, co couches, tables. Cheers. Uh, I'm Liz Rhodes, technical distiller and spirit consultant, and Whistle Piggyan. Oink, oink. Oink, oink. Oink, oink. Hand. <laughs> oink, oink. Very, very good. I spent most of my career um, at a small mom and pop shop known as Diageo. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe not. <laughs> But I'm currently founder and principal at Spirit Safe Consulting. Um, you can actually scroll down to the about the host section and check it out. Also, I'm now whistle peg in. Yeah, yes, you are. <laughs> you are. You are the whistle peg in. Absolutely. You're the whistle list piggy in we know. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Um, I'm Lou Bryson. I, uh, I write about whiskey um, for my living. Uh, I, I, I scribe for my supper, as it were. Um, I'm currently uh, a uh, senior drinks writer for the award-winning Daily Beast website. I'm also flogging 
madly my two books, the uh, the classic tasting whiskey and the newer uh, deeper dive whiskey masterclass. Thank you, thank you. Um, and wow, uh, today I am drinking uh, the Stranger from Proof and Wood, a seven year old 100% rye Polish whiskey, and um, that, that's drinking pretty good. Um, this has got the uh, real grainy character to it. I like it. Fabulous. And that's all I got. Uh, back to you, Marty, and uh, let's say hello. I'm going to support that with a little of our guests from last week, a little of uh, oh, Fort, Hamilton. Fort Hamilton. Nice. Good old Alex Clark. Uh, thank you, that big old ass bottle. And because our, this week's guest didn't send me any. <laughs> <laughs> Stinking. Now, this oh, week's so guest, <laughs> lovable, known him for over 20 years when he was just a wee high pup, following me around at whiskey events, yapping away, going, hey, hey, mister, hey, can I hang around you? Stuff really <laughs> embarrassing. Well, it was nice. He was a good kid. I, let, I taught him a few things. Uh, he uh, worked for uh, Whiskey Magazine back in the day. Uh, mm -hmm. going around up to tables. Hey, can I work for you in a Scottish <laughs> accent, which sounded a little phony if you ask me? Uh, a little put on. Uh, eventually, you know, he hooked on a job with uh, Morris and Bowmore, uh, representing their wicks, wickies, his their wickies, their wickies. No, that and, is how I consistently misspell it on my keyboard. Wickies always spelling wixy. <laughs> Drives me crazy. Sorry, I do too. I do too. Oh. With the the K. Lou, I'm glad. Yes, yes. Lou, I'm glad you did a spell check on your books. That's oh yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> Taste them wikis. <laughs> no, I've actually got the damn program set up so when I when I type that, it automatically changes it. Yeah. Oh, you can you, set that up. Ooh, yeah, yeah. That. Um, sorry. I now he there, is that just caught me. <laughs> brand ambassador and uh, what is that? What's that? What's that other thing? Advocacy, Advocacy manager. Which we're going to go into because we think that's another that on a card title. <laughs> we think that's like Lord uh, High Executioner kind of title. <laughs> um, so we're going to go into that. Everybody give a big round of applause to Mr. Gordon Dundas. Oh, hey. um, nice to be here. Thanks, guys. And uh, yeah, I, I, I cannot believe we've not got some whiskey to you. That is unbelievable. We will, yeah. get, yeah. to, we will get some to you. It. Don't worry. We will sort some out for you. So, yeah. Uh, great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, little Gordo, um, now you, you've you had an illustrious career, and I have followed it. In fact, I couldn't help but follow it. <laughs> I think, I can, I, can I just say somebody described yeah. me as a veteran? I'm, I'm like, a veteran? Oh, <laughs> man. Oh, really? Well, not an actual, like, live, I put my life no. on the line kind of veteran. No. no. no Industry not veteran. At all. You put your yeah, liver you're in the line. seasoned, buddy. Oh, yeah, see, you're seasoned like a like a good pork roast. Yeah, uh, something like that. That kind of annoying. I don't want to be a veteran, but okay. okay. <laughs> All right, you got a guy who's been around for at least twenty years in the industry, mm -hmm. an industry uh, pro. You are a professional. Pro, mm -hmm. not bad. Yeah, and you're an advocate. We're just gonna yeah, call yeah. you an yep. uh, advocate from now on. Um, okay. but, uh, you started off what now, what were you doing before you got involved with, uh, whiskey magazine? You, were you just a young kid with a dream? Or what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was just a, yeah, yeah. Just, you know, wandering around the streets going, God, I really want to work in whiskey. Um, no, I was an, <laughs> I actually graduated from university as an engineer. Whoa. No way! Wow, really? And wow. I worked in I worked in engineering for that four, diploma. Four, that four, education four, went well. Four yeah. or five years, I was an engineer, and let me tell you, the only good thing about engineering in in the UK at the time was that you could finish at one on a Friday. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> I mean, that was the yeah. only upside yeah, well, to being yeah, an engineer. It's the only good thing, yeah. Did it so make good money? Did, not at my level. Like, train engineer. Not at my level at that point. I was very young at that point. So, you know, I was making okay money, but it wasn't great. So, and then via another role working in sports hospitality. So, you know, boxes, at sporting games and things like that. 
I then fell into the whiskey industry, as it were, and that's how it sort of worked back in 2002. It's funny how many of us say that. What, fell into the whiskey industry? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't really know how I wound up here. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. 20 years later, here we are. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, I had an underlying love of whiskey, don't get me wrong, but, uh, you know, it was great to start working in whiskey and, and for Whiskey Magazine, which 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 was, you know, it was it gives you a great and Lou, Lou will know this to a certain extent because our paths crossed a lot at that point was <laughs> that you 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 get to see a lot of the industry um you know in in a way that you you know because you work for a sort of magazine that almost hovers above the industry you you see things that you don't normally get to see and you know you get mm. and you get to meet the most amazing people and that's the one thing i love about this industry is the people yeah I mean, I remember, uh, I am I think, I, I'm not sure it was the first time I met you, but I remember distinctly uh, spending time with you when you were doing uh, the Whiskey Live at mm-hmm. uh, in New York at a Tavern on the Green. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that had to be... Like 2006, I think, was the was first 2006? one. 2006? I thought it was earlier than that, but you're probably maybe right. Two th- probably about 2000, maybe 2005, 2005, 2006. Yeah. And that was the first ever show we put on in New York. And, you know, I, I, you know, there were, of course, already the, the whiskey fests in, you know, New York uh, that were run by Whisk Malt Advocate. Um, but uh, the Whiskey Live had developed in other parts of the world, and we put one in New York, and uh, quite one of the scariest things I've ever done. Well, now, why was that? Why did you think? Yeah, you well, just, you know, just, just, start, just putting on a, a whiskey show in a city you oh. don't know that well, um, with, you know, working with the industry was great and supported it, but just a really quite a scary thing in terms of, you know, uh, you know, just all the, the, the law, I mean, New York's full of laws, as you know. So even getting alcohol into the into the venues not easy, and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, it was it, it, we managed to pull it off and ran it there for for. I mean, it's, it still sort of runs effectively. So, uh, you know, I'm not involved anymore. But yeah, it was a great, great, you know, great to put on a whiskey show in in, in New York, for example. So I did enjoy that. I remember uh, we were working our table, the classic malt table, and uh, George Grant shows up with a shopping bag. I go, sure. What the hell? Do you, why do you have a shopping bag? Oh, I'm not. Yeah, I don't have a table here. I was, I was just shopping in New York. I heard there was a whiskey <laughs> live. <going on. laughs> he just, yeah, he was just attending. Sounds like my good friend George. Yeah, <laughs> I just thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, he goes, oh, yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was a fun event, actually. I remember that being just kind of a uh, weird. I think because everything was. It wasn't your typical venue. No, I think I think it was very different to a hotel ballroom, which you know, which works great because everybody's in the one room. But it was a bit more sort of over here than you walk through here, and it was a little bit more of a. It was a great event and uh, developed into, you know, back in sort of having it at in in Pier sixty in New York, which is a a really good venue for something like that. So yeah, it was it was good, really good. So how long were you with? Whiskey Magazine was a four, five years, eight, eight years, eight. eight years, eight years. So I mean, from that, you know, I started really, um, you know, my role was sort of developed pretty quickly. But basically, I was I was involved in, you know, being based in Scotland, talking to Scottish distillers, obviously, and then, and then I was over in the states a lot. So I was in the states in terms of uh, being in Kentucky and going to bourbon festivals and. And uh, seeing, meeting all those wonderful bourbon distillers, of which there were a lot less back then than yeah, there are now. That's for sure. yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, you really only had about eight or nine really back then. So now there's, yeah. you know, and it just sort of shows you how the, that whole industry has just blossomed Boom. and ballooned, doesn't it? Unbelievable. But you meet, but you meet these absolute legends of this industry, and you know they're still friends today. You know, and um, you know I used. Fred No, I met Fred No the first time and just a wonderful, you know, working for Whiskey Magazine. We went, did an event in his backyard at his house in Bardstown and and then I actually ended up working for him or working with him, not for him, but working with him when I worked oh, at Beanie. So, so, I mean, and he goes, I remember when you came and we had a barbecue and <laughs> he, he, he came out with this inimitable line. I think he came out with this amazing line where he said, 
he says, you know, some people say to me, what's the best bourbon and Coke? And, 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 and he, and, and he goes, well, you know, you can put Jim Beam white and have it with Coke or, or you can have, you know, Knob Creek and have it with Coke. It's, you know, and people go, oh, you put Coke in Knob Creek. He goes, well, hell yeah. If you want to have the best bourbon and Coke you possibly can, have a Knob Creek. <laughs> <laughs> you know, typical, typical Fred No, He's just like, yeah, just do what you want, man. Enjoy it. Yeah. So, yeah, you meet, and then you meet, you know, we were talking about Liz with, uh, with um, Whistle Pig. I mean, I, I, one of my, one of my most amazing Back in time, times. Just in time. <laughs> yeah, one of my most amazing times was with um, the late great Dave Pickerel at at, uh, at Maker's Mark when I went there the first time, and and again I ended up working with Maker's Mark, um, and he gave me the most amazing tour of Maker's Mark back in like two thousand and five or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I get one of those. That was and that he was, was just amazing at that, and you know, a, a real huge personality, and just so sad he's not with us anymore. Yeah, I remember going through makers with him, and we just tasted everything. Yeah, uh, he's dipping his hand in the in the fermenters, he's like yeah. cupping shit off the off the distill off the still, and we're supping that, and you know, grabbing yeah. stuff out of the out of the dump trough. You just mm. wow. Yeah, you know, was there there was a thing about the guys back then, especially. I mean, not that the guys today aren't made of the same cloth but uh, it just seemed like those guys were unstoppable someone like a, a pickerel you oh. met you meet dave pickerel and that guy just was he could go until the wee wee hours you know he could drink oh. cast strength whiskey like oh. you know you were giving him you know purified water and he would yeah. just be going <laughs> like there was yeah no i mean absolutely yeah. But you know, you look at you look at, but I think that's great, and you've got brilliant people like that. But you've also got you know this new exciting breed of which are doing really great things in whiskey, which I'm loving as well. So it, it, it you know that's true in Scotland as well, but also in America, and it and it's great to see. So you know, it's it's balancing old and new is all good. You know, well that must have been fun, and and Lou for you as well. I mean, the two of you were bouncing back and forth between, uh, you know mainly scotland and uh and mm. kentucky because that's yeah. where the a lot of the big stuff was happening and i don't know gordo if you were dealing much with ireland especially i guess during your whiskey magazine days there wasn't yeah, but... that much happening i mean obviously well, you have the big you have the three distilleries going in the yep. early aughts yep so there wasn't yeah i never did get to that. cooley kind of bummed me out you never got to cooley I oh. went a few times. It was because, um, again, I worked with Beam. So yeah. um, a, an interesting little distillery, Cooley, because you could do single malt and grain in the one place. And, you know, it was it, it produced some good whiskeys, really nice whiskeys. Yeah. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, I mean, Irish whiskey back then, again, was not, I mean, it's now, what, something like 30-odd distilleries in Ireland. And uh Back then, yeah. there was there was you know, as you say three. So yeah. the, the the change in the last since I've been in this industry, the change is utterly phenomenal, and and yeah. that's true here. You know, I remember when I was back in uh, when I was back in you know in Scotland, there was you know at the beginning there was like three distilleries in the Lowlands. Yeah. There's now eighteen, something like that. So is there eighteen? Something like that. Sixteen, seventeen, something holy, like that. Yeah. Holy shimoleons. I know that I remember at least about 10, 12 years ago. I remember we used to talk about 90 distilleries in Scotland. I believe it's up to around 150 now. So even about, Scotland. I think it's about 135, 130, something like that. I think it, I thought it was yeah. 150. Could be, could be. Maybe that's the ones that are planned, but I think open is yeah, right. I think you know, even in Ireland, I think you know, when they say 30, there's 30s, uh, 30 under construction or, or planned, yeah, and yeah, you know, there's, yeah. so there's all that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think it might actually be up to 30 by now. Operating. Actually, it's in been, production? Yeah, it's oh. been like 30 planned for a while. I think they're finally mm -hmm. coming on. Yeah, I don't know. But, you know, they've had so many, so many have gone, you know, like they've, so many have even broke ground and then they've lost funding. And oh, you know, that's true. There's been yeah. so much of this back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it. That's why it's so confusing. Um, yeah. So now, how uh, was it through Fred that you got into uh, Beam Suntory? 
No. So what happened with that was I I left my role at Whiskey Magazine um, because I had this un. I really wanted to work for a producer. I really wanted to work for a whiskey company. So I joined Morrison Beaumont, which was, um, you know, uh, a, a Suntory owned business. Um, Morrison Beaumont since the nineties. They don't. They don't. More, and so their real, their only international whiskey at that point was Beaumont, Ockentoshan, and Glengarry, and very much left on its own to do its own thing. They weren't. You know, they were quite happy. It was doing a good job. And then obviously in 2014, Suntory purchased Jim Beam, and the whole big thing that Jim that, that Beam Suntory is was created uh, in 2014 uh, when they took that acquisition of uh, of Beam and and um, and then Morrison Beaumont was rolled into Beam Suntory, and my role went from just single malts into the wider portfolio. Uh -huh. So I was I was working with Fred or not, you know, certainly involved in selling Jim Beam and talking about Jim Beam and talking about, you know, um, you know, talking about the barrel programs for Knob Creek and things like that. So it was, it was a real, and, and the, you know, the, the, uh, the same with the, the select, the, the maker's mark as well. So it, it was, um, it was, it was really interesting. And I, I'd, I'd been, as Lou knows, I'd been to Kentucky a lot and, and spent a lot of time in Kentucky as, as we, you know, as we both had. And, uh, you know, I I I'd, I'd had a love for bourbon anyway, so that was great. Yeah, you didn't seem to have any problem getting it down, you. <laughs> no, no, no. Particularly late at night in the Hampton Inn. Yes. <laughs> I remember when I walked into so for those who, well, they may not know, we after the gala dinner, which is the Saturday night of the bourbon festival. Yeah. Um, everybody, everybody was staying in the Hampton Inn pretty much, and it was just nearby. So there was always these parties in the sort of two relatively small meeting rooms, I guess, at the bottom of the stairs in the yeah. Hampton Inn. And there's, you know, there's great bourbons on the table, and there's people that, you know, and it's Jimmy Russell's there, and yeah. you know, there's a whole load of legends and you know, you know, from the industry there, and good friends of all of ours, and. I remember walking in and clearly everybody at this point's had a few bourbons and uh, <laughs> I walk in and Lou's sitting at a table and it, and somebody goes, Ooh, and I look at the, I don't know who it might've been Chris Comstock to be fair. And uh, he goes, Ooh, malt advocate meets whiskey magazine. And it was like that. And, and, and it was like, and Lou and I just looked at each other, sat down, and had a drink. It was. <laughs> wasn't that wasn't that the year that you and I were slinging out all the magazines at the damn gala? Anyway. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I remember yeah. getting sweaty yeah. as hell unpacking yeah, yeah. case after yeah. case of magazines. Yeah, and 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 I'm taking malt advocates out of people's hands and putting in whiskey magazine, <laughs> and then you're and then you're taking whiskey magazine out the other. But, but yeah, it's quite funny. <laughs> all done in the best friendly way, of course. <laughs> that was a good night. <laughs> very funny yeah but it was i mean you know so to have that sort of background of you know what it's like back you know you there's some really and there's most of them are still in the industry you know the people yeah. we're talking about are all still there and uh you know uh, you know just to, to to i've not been in kentucky for well obviously for probably about three or four years so yeah. in fact maybe even five years so it would be lovely to go back but uh, uh i miss a lot of the my friends over there but uh uh, and I'd love to see, you know, who else was I thinking of? Um, I was telling a story about Julian and Preston Van Winkle the other day. I mean, good, you know, another good friend. So you know them all as well. And it's just, it's, it would be nice to see them all after what's been happening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what that... we do. I mean, we, I was at uh, ACSA with uh, Marty back in what, early December yeah. in Louisville. But, you know, you didn't really see any of the big distillers. I mean, I went oh, down no. to, Mictors, but mm. that's about it. No, those yeah. guys don't really. I mean, they don't partake in that. And uh -huh. then they're, um, yeah, the, the whole thing with there are now so many events now in Kentucky. Uh, I was down there four times. I was down there four times since August, between August and December. Since August. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there was, um, you know, uh, loads of different events, and that's just it. it's kind of fractionalized a little bit. Yeah, I saw that with beer too. Yeah, and I mean, Early there's so many different events. Brewers were there. Now it's just people. And I think uh, was it the uh, 
the KDA has kind of teamed up with Bourbon and Beyond. Was that right? With Bourbon and Beyond uh, mm -hmm. to do their event, which is going to be different from uh, the Kentucky Bourbon Festival. So, yeah. And then yeah. you have um, uh, Bourbon Affair, which is Bourbon, the Bourbon Review guys. Oh, I thought that so, was KDA. No. Okay. No, that's the Bourbon Classic. Ah. Uh, oh, okay. wait. No, Bourbon. No. Oh, Bourbon Affair. That's Bourbon Affair. Yeah. Bourbon Classic is Bourbon, bourbon Classic guys. is the, yeah. Well, you know, that's what happens when there's money. <laughs> yeah. There's money in yeah. it. That's why they did it. Well, yeah. That's well nice. and you know, Kentucky is like the Disneyland of bourbon. Yeah. Or you know, so yeah, you're is. gonna yeah. why not have something as long as you spread it out and not but unfortunately, uh it was really everyone just shoved all their events into the back of the year. So yeah. it was all pretty clumped together. Yeah. Uh and now uh Mr. Fred Minnick, he has his yep. he, he has his own little event. The Ascot, the Ascot Awards. So you can get in on that, Gordo. Boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boom. I'm just, I'm just looking at the chat. I just want to say hello to Julia Nuri uh, from Germany, uh, who's a good friend of mine. I haven't seen her for a long time. Julia, hello. Yeah. How are you? Oh, and here, uh, Brad, Brad's son. Brad, oh yeah, there we bottle go. right here. Hey, Brad. Mm. Panamanian whiskey, Gordo. Oh, nice. Should add that to your. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to get some of that. Is all your spirits, they're all from Scotland? No, not all of them, but most of them, yeah. yeah. Most of them. We do, we do do some rum. Um, but yeah, nice Panamanian whiskey. Nice. Brad? I mean, they, 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 they do Gorda. mostly rum, too. So this was, is that, that's the first bottling of whiskey you did, right? Yeah, the very first, yeah. 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 Um, hmm. And actually, Brand is technically not with them now. They had a Oh, right. right after right. our show. Right. Um, but he's I think he's still consulting with them and now he's doing some some freelance consulting as well. Hey, uh, so let's talk about your whiskey, mister. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because I last time I got to taste or uh and hear about your whiskey was probably 2019 at the Victoria Whiskey Festival, which is a great whiskey festival. People probably hopefully Fabulous. they'll have it later this year. Fabulous um, whiskey festival. Yeah. yeah, it's real a beautiful town, a great event, and I believe the money went towards charity, if I'm not mistaken. Oh wow! I think better. there is a big charity element to yeah. it. Yeah, that's true. Really yeah, good. So you get well, great guys. Them. Gotta love them. Yeah. Cheers to our friends, of Victoria. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Let's talk. Let's talk single more. Yeah. You got uh, Tamdu. Tell me Tam more Do. about Tamdu. I've I know very little about that whiskey, though I've. I've seen Likewise. the name. I've heard the name so well, many it's, times. It's a whiskey that's, um, I mean, it's a distillery that's, it's a really big distillery. It's um, really, that's not math, but 4 million liters. So it's not a small okay. distillery, Yeah, not insignificant. And really as part of our, we acquired it in 2011, it used to be part of Edrington. So, you know, same as McAllen. Um, and uh, we, we acquired it as Ian McLeod in 2011. Uh, relaunched it with a 10 year old in literally 2013, 2014, because um, that's all the stock we had. And we've had to wait and wait and wait. And we, we launched it. We then changed the 10 to a 12. We launched a 15. And this year coming, we're going to launch an 18. So the thing that makes Tamdu really unique is, is um, and, and we all like that in terms of single malt, is it only matures from start to finish in Oloroso sherry casks. So there's wow. no bourbon casks, okay. no no uh, PX, no any other types of cask. It's only Oloroso sherry casks. So so that means that we focus really strongly on full maturation in those casks. And that's that means, therefore, the two types of oak that we use. So American oak imported into mm. Spain to make these Oloroso sherry casks or Spanish oak from northern Spain are the two types of oak. Now, they're hugely different. And we combine them all together in our 12 or 15 or our higher strength version. And that's ultimately what we do with Tamdu. And that's why when you drink a Tamdu, you get a very different, I think a very different experience because you get a thicker, sort of thicker, richer experience because that's a little bit of what European oak sherry does, but it combines really well with the fruitiness of the spirit, which is not, you know, not 
uh, is fundamental. There's a little bit of oiliness in there, but it's you know the, the spirit is all about creating that fruitiness as well. So, so it, it, for me, it's a it's a it's I mean, it, it, we are on allocation globally. We don't have loads of stock because of the availability of sherry casks. But the best thing about it is Leonard, who is our owner of Ian McLeod Distillers and is a, a you know a, a legend in the industry. Um, when he bought the distillery, he he decided. I mean, he was walking through the the warehouses and went, "I just want to make. I want to make this style of whiskey. I want to make sherry cask space side whiskey. That's all I want to do." And and immediately, what that said was, we were putting our style and our and, and our what we want to create ahead of volume, ahead of commercials. Uh, what the commercial return? If we use bourbon casks, we can make more mm. stock and. And I really like that as a position to have because it's really unique in the industry because we're family owned. We're not, we don't have those shareholder pressures that other businesses do. And, and um, Tamdu as a result of that decision from that day has only ever been, if it's in a b- bottle such as this, it's only ever been. Look at that color. All the I love it, box. So if I want to just sort of show you something that's sort of quite relevant between these two whiskeys, and I want to show you and your viewers is, these are two single casks, but I'm going to explain. That is the most amazing European oak sherry cask. That is um, about a 15, 16 year old sherry cask. Um, and you can see that beautiful color that comes from those European oak full term maturation sherry casks. If I hold up an American oak sherry cask, you can see the color difference. And that is down to they both go through the same process. They both go through the same six year production process that that um, that 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 the cask goes through in 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 Spain itself in terms of air drying seasoning with sherry and the cask being transported to Tamdu, but you can see the color difference and the flavor difference that comes from the American oak sherry cask or the European oak sherry cask. And I think so. So what that says to me, and it's one of the things that Tamdu is beginning to get through to a lot of people in the industry, is that sherry casks are not just one dimensional. They are fabulously diverse. They can produce wonderful, subtle whiskies or bolder, you know, those thick, tannic, dry type whiskies as well. And so um, Tamdu, I think when people drink it, they go, hmm, this is a different. And obviously our sort of standard, our 12 or 15 is a combination of these in, in each bottle uh, in various ratios. But that what, what that really says to me is that, you know, the, 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 the sherry cask really delivers something really, really different. And you can do the big, bold, you know, dark flavors, or you can do the more subtle flavors because of how you marry them together. Now, gents, and this goes to both of you. Um, I once tasted, a, I think it was a 15-year-old single malt that had been matured completely in a first fill sherry cask. <clears throat> and uh, it was a uh, Mike Miller here in Chicago. Yeah, at Delilah's had it. Uh, it was going to be. Say hello to him, by the way, when you see him. Uh, certainly, certainly. Um, he was. Uh, I think it was for his fifteenth anniversary. That's how long ago it was. That was, jeez, mm. twelve years ago, I guess. Um, he um, he he gives some to me, and uh, and you know, the first thing that kind of hit me, I, I liked it. I thought it tasted good. Mm. But I didn't think it tasted like scotch. I thought it tasted a lot like really strong, tasty sherry. And I thought, is that a case of the sherry just overtasting, overtaking the whiskey mm. and becoming well, a, kind of a completely different animal? And this well, has always I mean, been my problem with, you know, first fill sherry cast with, you know, over maturing in those casts. Well, I mean, I, I I have the same argument with, if I'm honest, o- o- aged bourbon. Oh yeah, there's yeah. Some, there's like... some bourbons that just start mm-hmm. tasting of wood to me, and I'm like, this is spicy oh. and not my style. And totally you know, they're re- those really dark bourbons. You know, there's one or two of them. I just like this is too old. It's not my style. Yeah. It's. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the first thing from a there's two things to always consider here is, and, and my view would be. If you're fully maturing in a sherry cask, then the sherry that's in that cask that was in it, that's been emptied out of it, is going to, the, the remaining amount of sherry, which is not that much in the oaks, not going to have a lot of impact over 15 years 
you're looking at the, oak, the, the these color differences come because of the oak, not because of the sherry. So mm -hmm. it's because of the oak types that give yeah, you. Yeah, I mean they're, they're the both sherry types. casks, right? Just yeah, they're both wood. sherry casks that yeah. different work. However, the other thing to consider is if you're finishing in sherry, then you may be looking for more of that impact of what was in that cask that before. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things to consider. But there's absolutely no doubt that if you mature a certain spirit in a first fill European oak Oloroto sherry cask in a small one, so maybe not a butt, maybe a hogshead or something mm. like that, it could get overpowered by that age. I mean, it depends so much on so many factors. But um, And I would bank if it was dark colored, it was probably European oak, could be PX, could have been could have been all a Rosso sherry, but uh, it could well have been overtaken by the by the by the cask, not so much the sherry. Because the one thing that people forget is that the European oak element brings out those tannins and those dark fruits, which which somehow somehow are sherry like. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but um, actually, again, if you go back to this whiskey, which is an American oak sherry cask, you don't have those sherry flavors so much. You have much more of those vanillas and stewed fruits and, you know, those types of flavors in here because this is the same oak that's used in a bourbon cask, but it's just been made into a sherry cask. And that's the, so it has the vanillins, whereas the European oak has the oh. tannins. So, so that's the, that's, the, that's what I love about Tamdu and, 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 you know, the, the diversity that these casks can bring you, but there's no doubt that sherry can overpower uh, or sherry casks can overpower spirit yeah for sure yeah i don't i don't think a lot of people get that 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 i i i'm i think most of them believe that it's the the sherry that has soaked into the cask and is still left in the cask that's flavoring the whiskey it, it's the wood it's still it's the, the wood. wood it's wood that matures whiskey and i remember yeah i remember uh charlie mclean was in a was in a class of mine uh and uh i said that in his <laughs> right? class and, I had and same he, reaction <laughs> and, and, and and he and uh I know I was quite scared when he was sitting yeah. there. Uh, and he turned around and he went, oh, thank God, Gordon. Thank God is what he uh, So, yeah. That's a great I mean, moment. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, it, it's absolutely right is that, you know, it's not – you get it. You, you mature a whiskey, a scotch whiskey in an ex-bourbon cask. Yes, there's a tiny percentage. There's a bit of bourbon in the oak. But in a 20-year maturation, it's not – it's not um, – flavoring the whiskey at all it's the oak that's flavoring the whiskey through that really charred layer you know that's this got... is the thing that i get and the that's most the really big point. on in whiskey master class yeah because i talk about this in there and mm. more than anything else as soon as the book came out people are like i don't think that's right i'm like based on what asshole <laughs> <laughs> that your yeah, mama yeah. told you it was the sherry come on yeah. Hmm. I mean, I'm sorry. I actually I mean, talked to the people who did this shit. What do you do? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> readers. I mean, I, th I th what I think is really, you know, when you go to Spain, and I thought I knew a lot about sherry cast before I went. And mm. for those of people who 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 want to really know more about what I'm talking about, we did a really good video on the Tamdu website. It's also on YouTube. Spain to space side Tamdu. Just type that in. Watch it. Twelve minutes of sherry cask knowledge. If you want to, it's not. It's not particularly about, a, I mean, it's a bit about a brand, but it's all about just understanding the process. What I think is really, really important is when you go to, when you go to Kentucky, let's talk about bourbon cats. You go to Kentucky, you see these casts made and they're charred on the inside for about a minute, maybe what's that, about four char, five char, something like that. Um, and it doesn't actually impregnate that deep into the oak, you know, it, and, and, and then it goes into a rack house and you can, put it in the high top corner and you get a hotter, you know, get a different maturation than you do in the lower bottom, it's, you know, all this kind of stuff. Four to six years bourbon goes out and it comes to Scotland. Now what, what people forget is yes, there's a little bit of bourbon in the oak, but the, that bourbon that was in that cask has taken out a lot of that, you know, a lot of that sweetness, a lot of that influence yeah. from the, from that cask. So when we then put our spirit into it, our new make spirit, we're putting new make spirit into a cask that's held bourbon. Yes, a little bit of that bourbon will leach out in the, in, in the first uh, instance. But as you mature very slowly in Scotland, the influence that mm -hmm. comes all the time is coming from that oak, coming from what, what that bourbon has been colored from. So that's why you get less color in Scotland because of the temperatures, which are lower. 
it's the same in sherry. The sherry has gone into the cask to effectively prepare the cask for our spirit going into it. Um, so, you know, that's the point is the sherry has, if we, if we just took the cask as new, newly toasted into Scotland, you'd get a very tannic, dry, almost pungent, too strong, too much. So the sherry's role is to take out the compounds and some of the things we don't want in our whiskey. And that's why we season the modern day sherry cask is a seasoned sherry cask. And you so can you use say, all the roster. When you say seasoned, do you mean air seasoned or sherry seasoned? What I mean is when I say seasoned, firstly, I know what you mean by seasoning. So so the role of the cat the cask, the tree is <laughs> cut down. The tree is cut down, for example, cut into staves and air dried for two okay. years in yeah. Spain. So initially in northern Spain, then down in Jerez, where it's very hot. Oh, okay. Um, so about two, two and a half years. And then it's made into a cask, toasted on the inside, not for not charred, much lower temperature, 30 to 40 minutes, both American oak casks and European oak casks at that point. And then they're filled with Oloroso sherry, five, seven-year-old Oloroso sherry, uh, and, and as we would call it, seasoned, um, i.e. that sherry is in there for two plus years, getting that oak ready okay. and taking out some of the unwanted elements we don't want um, so that when that sherry is emptied, it's quite spicy. It's taken out some of the some of those really strong tannins and compounds that would maybe mess up our whiskey, and the cast then come to Scotland. So it's a six year process, and that's the the sort of effort that goes into making these sherry casks, and they're very expensive, about ten yeah. times the price of a bourbon cask. And when did all that start? I mean, there was a time. I remember uh, it was. Within the last 20 years, I remember them talking about this 20 odd years ago, uh, where casts, bourbon casts <clears throat> were a couple hundred bucks. Sherry casts were more expensive, but they weren't what they are now. Yeah, now, nuts yet. They, what? It hadn't gone nuts yet. And now it's crazy. Yeah. And there was an effort, at least here among some bartenders, uh, to bring sherry back to the people to really reintroduce, which I think is great. I went out and bought a bunch of sherry myself just to reintroduce myself. Mm. Or actually, introduce myself to a lot of sherry because mm. it's not, not something that we had a lot of around the house. No, a little well, Irish family on the southwest side of Chicago, not exactly a bunch of sherry <laughs> drinkers. Yeah, I remember there, my mom had from, a bottle of uh, the Harvey's Bristol Cream because yeah. she's uh, <laughs> advertised, you know? She's like, oh, let's get that. If it wasn't uh, De Kuiper or De, uh, Dubois, um, you know, uh, liqueur, you know, we didn't yeah. have it. Blackberry, you know, brandy, something like that. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. I mean, when did all the, when did, when did it really just go nuts? How much is a sherry cast now? So like a, I would say, well, they've gone up. They have gone up significantly during 2000? what's been going on. But I would think, top. I would think probably touching fifteen hundred pounds. So probably oh two thousand, two thousand two hundred dollars, over two thousand dollars. I would think. Wow. For a bit wow. of wood, no, for no, bits of wood. And that and one of the crazy. and one of the really interesting. And this goes back to what we do as a business. I love this fact. It's a, I say to say in a masterclass, or I say to you know say to people so you know we've got these great sherry casts in spain how are we going to get to how are we going to get them to scotland you know um and everyone on a boat yes they will be on a boat but <laughs> how how, we, how how are you going to get them to scotland and they go um in a container yes yes in a container how would you efficiently put them in a container and every people go, oh, we'll break them down put them on pallets and then I sort of say well yeah but that yep yeah, find that yep yeah, absolutely that's a very efficient way of getting them to scotland However, you've just spent six years making this cask. Why on earth would you break them down? Uh, let's keep them whole and send them whole. Yeah, we're not going to be able to transport as many. But if you break them down, your whiskey's only going to taste worse. It, it will not taste better. Absolutely not. Exactly. Yeah. It will never taste better. It's only yeah. going to taste worse. So it's that attention to detail. When you're using natural color and you're using a new, you, you are dedicated to producing sherry cask style whiskey. That's the attention to detail you have to have. And in Ian McLeod, uh, you guys are located uh, outside of Glasgow, are you not? Our our head office is outside of Edinburgh, so only about oh Edinburgh, 
40 minutes from Glasgow, so it's not far. Um, so where uh, would uh, where's your maturation center? Well, we have uh, a lot of it is up at Tamdu. One. So our main, we have very little space at our sister distillery, Glengoyne. We have built 24, and I think we're building another eight. So 30, about 30 warehouses Ooh. up at Tamdu. Um, we've been buying land and building more warehouses. There's a really big shortage of warehousing in Scotland. Um, and um, one or two other little sites, but most of it is up at up at Tamdu. So a lot of Glen Goyne sits up at Tamdu um, uh, as well as, but they all gets moved around as well. So, you know, um, that's where our, probably our big, our biggest maturation site is Tamdu, which is, which is on the River Spey next to Nokando, as you, a distillery you probably used to talk about, Martin. Yeah, I I always like that name too because I always sound like, uh, hey, can we go there? No can do. <laughs> no, no, no can do. Um, yeah. I went to uh, Glen Goyne with uh, Andy Davidson. He took me uh, yes. one of the prettiest distilleries. That's a beautiful little distillery. But again, you know, really very crazy. near Glasgow, but yeah, you know, one, yeah. Million, one million liters only, not four. Oh, so wow. very small. Yeah, very small. Kind of in the hills. It's almost kind of running up the side of a hill it is is it is yeah it's a beautiful distillery very sort of it's probably the most accessible now there are some stunningly beautiful distilleries i think glen goyne is right up there with some of the best but uh it's the most accessible really looking really beautiful looking distillery if you know what i mean um and uh i mean it's stunning and produces a really fruity spirit produces a really um great 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 single malt because again that all I've talked about, you know, the sherry cast that we use, we use a bit of bourbon at Glen Goyne as well, but, um, you know, great, great quality uh, uh, product. And it all is because we're a family business. It genuinely all comes from that. Hey, you know, uh, one of your whiskeys I want to talk about is uh, actually, well, we want to get to Rosebank. Before we do, just real quick, it was a whiskey that I always had to talk about because when I used to work for Johnny Walker, we had Johnny Walker Green Label, mm. uh, blended malt. Yeah. And there weren't a lot of blended malts out there. Mm. And for folks out there who aren't aware, I'm, I don't think there are any people nowadays who don't know what a blended malt is. But for those who don't, blended malt is a blend of single malts with no single grain whiskey. And Johnny Walker was a blend of roughly 15 different single malt whiskeys. Uh, Were there any other blended huh? malts? Were there any other blended malts at the time? Well, yeah, John Glazer doing a few, but I mean, they're they're yeah, yeah. smaller number. Oh, right? Monkey shoulder wasn't around at that point. wasn't around yet, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you had uh, your sheep dip. Yeah, yeah. So, so sheep. Well, yeah, sheep. I, I when, think when, sheep dip was what? been been around for a while. Yes, it has. Like, so, 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 I'll give you a bit of the history. So, in 2016, we purchased a business called Spencerfield Spirits, which we bought predominantly for a brand called Edinburgh Gin, which is a very big gin in the UK, uh, about the sixth or seventh biggest branded gin in the UK. Um, uh, and as you probably know, guys, gin in the UK is just silly. The amount of gin that's here is... <laughs> the Brits is, do like the gin, I do say. Yeah, uh, sure. yeah, sure. I do like a gin. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And then the world. We, I remember in a bit like what we're saying about the bourbon industry. I remember in being in a supermarket 15 years ago, and your your bog standard gin was a Gordon's, and your premium was a Bombay Sapphire. Oh, how the world has moved on! Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and gin is now just. I mean, it's every every. There's a gin all over the place, and yeah. and um, you know, it's a great drink. I love a gin and tonic. You know, I love a gin and tonic. I love a Negroni. Fantastic drink. Um. Mm -hmm. So Edinburgh Gin was purchased by us in 2016, and along with that came Sheep Dip and Pig's Nose. So just to be fair to Spencerfield, who was run by Alex Nickel at that point and his family, they developed those brands and got them really to where they were in the U.S. with their distributors and things like that, as well as around the world. Um, and uh, we got them as part of that deal. So we continued them on, and Sheep Dip was is a is a blended malt um, and it's got blended malts from all over. Um, but it had this unique name because historically what used to happen was that the, the farmers who were making the whiskey used to, used to hide the whiskey in casks that said sheep dip on them so that, so that the, the tax man would not look in them. So 
Um, sheep dip, for those who may not know, is something that you would dip your to disinfect your sheep. You stick them in a sort of oh, bath, God. basically. Thank God. Yeah, I know. Nasty so, smelling stuff right here. I always thought yeah. it was just sheep poop. No, oh, no, 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 no. It's, sort of a, it's it a disinfectant, I think, ultimately, to stop them getting whatever like sheep get. And, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, all that like kind that. of stuff, I think. Yeah. So um, that's where the name comes from, and it's a blended malt. Now, it, it's a pretty small blended malt. We, we're, we're planning a to do a lot more in the U.S., and we sell it, um, and we, we are making gains with it in, in the U.S., but blended malt is a category dominated by you know, ultimately, monkey shoulder is the major yeah. blended malt in the industry. But I actually genuinely believe in the next five years, blended malt is going to become a lot more popular because there's a reason for blending malts together. You know, why wouldn't you blend malts together? Because you've got these regional differences that you can bring together and, you know, create a great orchestra. So I think blended malt's a category that will really grow. But I think it's a category that struggles because it's got the word blended in it. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I wholly agree. It's funny the whole uh, the whole debacle with uh, the Cardew yeah. added malt, which you know they take that away and they say, "Oh well, you know, we're gonna straighten that whole thing up. We're gonna make you know get away, get rid of all the confusion. And just call mm. it blended malt. That yeah, will, no confusion there. That will solve everything." Jesus God. Uh, which was yeah. such a, a stupid thing because uh, vatted, I thought, was a much better term. In, in in my view, single malt should be single malt. Blended malt should be malt. And blended mm. should be blended. It should just be malt whiskey or single That's malt whiskey. Yeah. yeah, Single malt whiskey, product of one distillery, single malt. Malt, no. a combination of malts, malt whiskey. And blended whiskey, a combination of grain and malt. Um, and I mean, there we go. There you go, SWA sorted. Huh. Gordon and Jeff are headed to the <laughs> SWA. Yay. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think I think blended malt will become a really interesting category in the next. Uh, I mean, there's some guys who've done amazing stuff like Compass Box and uh, you know things like that. But um, certain and Julia, Julia from Germany thinks it should be fatted malt. So yeah, it shouldn't. The I can go back to that it. easily. The word blended yeah. does not help that category. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Nope. 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 You nope. know what? That's what I typically, you know, uh, I go, I revert back to it when I, to the word vatted, when I'm talking mm. about that, I say, you yeah, know, they vat various whiskeys together. That's what I say. Mm. Mm. So I, to me, that's the best yeah, word yeah. For it. Good term. It was ridiculous to get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, strange. So much of that was just stupid politics. It was a great story that I wish Nick Morgan would come back on and talk about it, but he doesn't want to. <laughs> um, uh, so um, uh, another. Oh wait, wait. One last thing about that is uh, how many how many malts go into it? Do you know? Can it's you about say? it's about twelve, somewhere in the region of twelve. Okay. To 15. Yeah. All right. So right in um, the the Johnny Walker Green. Yeah neighborhood yeah look i mean if you know there's there's a as you know when you're blending you've got sort of right, right. topper varies. malts and ones which will generate more flavor and ones that are more yeah. base malts so yeah similar to blending how you would blend a uh a, a blended whiskey yeah right uh um, yes well you i mean the only other, the other category that i think will come back actually is blended whiskey as well i think blended whiskey is uh you know, in years it's been in slight decline, but actually, I think pre more premium blended whiskey will become more popular again because I think there's some really interesting stuff out there and brand brands that have got really aged blended whiskey. One of the ones we have is Isle of Sky, which is an amazing whiskey. Mm. Which we have everything. We've got an eight, a twelve, yeah. an eighteen, a twenty-one, a twenty-five, and a thirty, all blended whiskey. And they taste incredible. So, you know, when you have that option, then blended whiskey, granted, more at the premium end will start to add more into that category, I think. So, so, I'm so are you blending that on the Isle of Sky? No. no. Okay. All right. As long as there's truth in advertising. It's, that's not, what, it's not blended, that's, it's not yeah, blended on the Isle of Sky. All the whiskey's not from the Isle of Sky. But it's better not. Yeah. Is there a second <laughs> story yet? Of course. Of course, of course. Sorry. <laughs> Is there a second distillery yet? There, there is one called Toravig. Yeah, Toravig ah, is. A, they did. They did. Build there one? is a okay. second distillery, but of course, Talisker 
The Talisker. most famous of them all. Talisker. <laughs> yeah. I was there. I was there not two months ago. Oh, uh, uh, see, see to me, me in lockdown in Scotland, you got all that freaking highlands. Yeah. I just I escaped out of the Highlands and say, fuck you. Lock me down up here. I'll try it. Little hand in my kilt. Hey, yeah. come and get me. Oh, good. Good. Bastards. Really but yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, 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 I think if you look at whiskey generally in the last 10, 15 years, Lou, you, you've seen it. It's been a great 10 or 15 years, you know, it really has. And, and I don't yeah. see any reason why the next 10 or 15 won't be as good. You know, uh, it's funny, uh, not not to get off topic too much, but, uh, uh, you know, you talk about blends. Um, I'd like to see them. Uh, I'd like to see uh, the Walkers, instead of uh, doing all these uh, high-end ones, especially mm. for, for Asia, mm. I'd like to, I would like to see if they could recreate uh, Johnny Walker White Label. Just to see what it was like, if they still had the you know, the blending notes for that, you know, something I'm... a little more affordable. You ever say yeah. that the white label that was the original? I've never seen that, I don't remember hearing no. about that. That was from the was early, label. that was around for about eight, nine years in the early 20th century. Oh, really? That yeah. was uh, right after it went back when there was the original red and black, and then there was white label. Then they did away oh. with that, and the next. Johnny Walker to ever come around was um, swing oh, after right, during the waning well, days of prohibition. Yeah, if you ever want to hear the history of Johnny Walker, I'll be doing a special uh, three-hour uh, you you, PBS special. You can either listen to Marty or you can go to the Johnny Walker experience in Edinburgh. I'll be doing that special <laughs> from the Johnny Walker experience there. Yeah. They won't know it. And I won't be paid, but yes, that's where I'll be going. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a, I think there's definitely a market for more blended whiskeys, like priced in that thirty to fifty range. Yeah, I mean, yeah. especially if there's a kind of a cool history. And actually, no. you're you're drinking proof and wood. Uh, Dave Schmier has uh, done wonders with making a lot of very affordable whiskeys. Yes, he puts out a lot of high end stuff, but. He plays both mm. sides of the swimming pool, the deep yeah. end, and the yeah. shallow end, and his his shallow end uh, whiskeys yeah. do very oh, well. Tumbling dice, I I drink that pretty oh, regular. God. Yeah. Oh yeah. my god, that's good whiskey. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, and I totally agree with that, and I think there is a little bit of the other blended whiskey that I admire in terms of how it positions itself, how it's referred to, and how people talk about it is Hibiki. Oh yeah, yeah. I yeah. Mean, it's, it's actually talked about. I mean, some of the prices now are silly, but yeah. it, it's talked about and ha and was even ten years ago like a single malt. And the presentation is lovely, and the whiskey is yeah, great, gorgeous. and, and uh, uh, everybody yeah. goes, "Well, oh, so is that a blend?" And and they, yeah. you know, but actually, yes, it is a blend. But it's a real blend that's done on the artistry of blending and the and and it's a it's a quality product. And I think there's also a market for that sort of product as well. But see, that's the interesting thing. That was a, a whiskey that had been around. Yeah. And people kind of mm. overlooked it because, ah, it's a Japanese whiskey. Why do the Japanese know about whiskey? Blah, blah, blah. And that was the general public. There was already a pocket of people who said, no, yeah. I think you're overlooking this. I'll and that it. group started, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's when it starts from, yeah. It started growing, and then they go, oh, yeah. oh, wait a minute, I want it. Now you can't get it, and the price is it. sore, and... Now and that's a bit like what has happened with Tam Du and, and Glenn Going, to be honest, is that yeah. we're never we're never gonna have the, the ability to do the advertising or the engagement that the big brands do. But what we find with Tam Du is it's people going, What do you drink that? You should try this as well. This is absolutely fabulous. And it's those sort of friend recommendations and that type of thing that's really made Tam Du, you know, garner a really strong following, which we're really excited about. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, Mr. You got uh, your Rose Bank. Oh, yeah. Which yeah, yeah. I think a lot of folks are going to be, you know, anybody who's up on, on you know, uh, silent distilleries and and uh, whiskeys that have, have had trickles of the old stuff out there. And then you got the return, the resurgence, the phoenix, raising all the ashes. 
Yeah, so this is uh, this, this is Rosebank thirty. Year old. <laughs> yeah. So this is Rosebank thirty, and um, like anybody who knows anything about Scotch whiskey is uh, will be aware of how important this whiskey is to to single malt Scotch. And so, you know, Rosebank's a great distillery that shut in 93, 1993. And it was owned by Diageo effectively at that point. And um, although they weren't called Diageo, they was Diageo. Um, and Michael Jackson, who Lou, I'm sure you've met. Did you meet Michael Jackson? You must have met Michael Jackson. Well, we got to edit him for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I work, I work, is, that was yeah. fun. <laughs> I, I, I work with him at Whiskey Magazine. Not the singer for anybody who's but Michael no. Jackson, the beer writer who, who it was, I mean, hugely significant for beer, but hugely significant for whiskey. Yeah. And he said, if there was ever a god, then Rosebank would be rebuilt and recreated. So we're, we're doing it. And, and I drove past the site, uh, and it's you know, we're, we're really down the road of this opening up and starting to produce spirit again. So, as part of our deal with Diageo to acquire the distillery, we uh. We got all the remaining stock of Rosebank, of which wow. this is this is one of the the first releases. We'll be bringing out another <laughs> another one Burn this year. <laughs> so this is a thirty year old Rosebank that we released uh, in uh, uh, the, just just sort of just in the middle of lockdown, really. Um, and um, we we launched that, and it's a thirty year old. All the stocks between nineteen eighty nine and nineteen ninety three. So. That's all the remaining stock there is, and we, we got all the remaining casts from Diageo. So we will, we will be we will be doing another release, which will be a thirty one year old coming out this year, and there will be bottles coming to the states. But it is on allocation; there is not lots of it, but it will be in a similar uh, vein to this bottle. And you know, where I've just been talking about sherry casks and the flavors and all that type of thing, here's a whiskey that was all about the spirit style, matured and refill. Refill mm. sherry casks and hogsheads, so the so the color and impact of those casks is much more in the background. It's how that spirit, which was soft and gentle, but had this bit of weight to it because we used worm tub condensers, which is pretty odd in Scotland. Not many distilleries do, although more do now. Um, it has this beautiful sort of uh, spirit style that comes to the fore, and it's a it's a it's a whiskey that um, it's a whiskey that really is is more famous for its spirit style than let's say let's say uh, the, um, the 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 cask or wood policy i mean the wood still has to be good but it's not it's not generating color like we saw in the tamdus and mm -hmm. so it's, it's a whiskey that's always been well renowned for its spirit style so that just shows you that single malt can be more cask influence or can be can be uh, you know less cask influence basically yeah i mean rosebank and um uh, Brora, uh, yeah. um, I mean, these, these have been those those ones that, that people have been mm. clamoring for. Uh, Brora, uh, what's the uh, Port Ellen? Port Ellen, mm -hmm. those are I mean, those have always been the big three. There's been a yeah. few others that yeah. people have always been clamoring. Oh, you got to bring back how much of the I thought Rosebank, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't a lot of Rosebank torn down though. The original, um, a lot before. of it was stolen. Um, if I'm honest, um, all the stills were stolen in the early 2000s because the copper price went through. Oh, the roof. right, right. So what happened? I've got a few good stories to about Rosebank, but when I first went there, um, it was just a pigeon graveyard, um, wow. and it was it was pretty horrific. Um, but the stills were stolen, and and what happened was that over time they'd taken patches of copper from the stills, and they'd started round the back so that. If you looked at the stills, you're like, "Oh yeah, there's stills," but actually, they had, no they had nothing around the back. Facades, um, just facades. Uh, yeah, in about 2006 or something like that. So all the stills were stolen. It was just a the whole site was a mess, and um, yeah. so we acquired the original site, we acquired the IP and all that, and and Diageo were hugely helpful on this, and um, oh. because they were keen to sell it to somebody who was going to do something with it, which is they knew oh. that Ian McLeod were going to do a really good job with it. Um, and we got all the remaining casks. Now, the, the the very interesting, the very funny story about this was back in October 2017. Um, I think um, Leonard, who's our, our our boss, I mentioned him earlier, was in discussions with Diageo for quite a long time. And um, I think they were like, "Do you mind not doing anything until the beginning of October?" 
in terms of a press release and telling the world that we've okay yeah fine um uh, we'll tell you why i mean the relationship <laughs> is the, the relationship the relationship is that good we'll tell you why and Leonard's like, no, don't tell me. I'll, 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 I'll just tell people. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. <laughs> so we're sort of waiting. And we're sort of, okay, let's see what happens. And then on the Monday of the 10th of October, 2017, or whatever it was, boom, 9 a.m. Monday morning, Diageo brings back Bora, Bora and poor Ellen from the dead, you know. Uh... And then on, so we had this quick panic meeting. And we're like, well, let's, just go, let's just go on Tuesday. <laughs> so Tuesday, we were like, Rosebank coming back from the dead on Tuesday. And everybody's like, and I got a, I got a, a message from, a, 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 you may remember, but it was a very good website that was run by Sukinda Singh called um, scotchwhiskey.com, which was a yeah. fabulous website. And if yeah. you know, I think it's still all online. If you, a, a really, really good website. And there was a lady called Becky Paskin who, sure. yeah. who, who writes for it. And Becky's a fabulous writer. And she, she said to me, I think she sent me a message and said, the one week I'm on flipping holiday. <laughs> three, I, three iconic single malt <laughs> distilleries get rebuilt. And you're like, sorry, sorry. Uh, but it was, a, it was a heck of a week that. And um, so, we, yeah, I mean, we, it's taken a long time, but we're six months, hopefully, from, from new spirit running through the stills of Rosebank awesome. again after night after. Uh, 29 30 years which is fabulous so we're really excited about it. it's a huge project for us and um it it's a it's a really unique style of whiskey lowland of course triple distilled but bizarrely condensed in worm tubs which is a really odd combination but that's probably why it's so popular two different directions yeah. well, you, well exactly you'd think light and worm tubs are heavy and but no. yeah weird so <laughs> well, that's that... maybe why it was what it was yeah. Well, what is there? There's only a handful of worm tubs being used now in Scotland, right? I mean, about... more than you think. I think there's really? I think there 20. was like only 20. Oh, wow. Yeah, I wow. Think probably about 20. I mean, you've got now these new got, guys. Yeah, them? quite a few new guys okay. are using uh, okay. them. Um, uh, traditionally, I think there was only about, I want to say, four or five. If, you know, yeah, maybe a wee bit more than that, but Craig Ellicky had them, Dal Winnie had them. Um, I know uh, there was only a handful of that. Well, that's Klein so, Leash not have them or Brora Mortlock, maybe, maybe Brora. I mean, don't forget, Brora was built to yeah. reproduce. I mean, Brora, no, Brora was Brora was the original Klein Leash, yeah, 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 but. When they restarted, it was supposed to reproduce Kalila. I don't know that number, but I would say at the moment it's probably upwards of twenty mm. that are well, using worm tubs. Still, though, that's a small portion of well, say the hundred and thirty to one hundred and fifty distilleries. Fifteen percent, yeah. So look, it's 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 such a unique way of using them. They need a lot of admin and a lot of uh, care. But from from our perspective, that we were never going to do anything different because. Rosebank was always known for having this odd That's combination of triple distillation and uh, and then using worm tubs. So, you know, and we've got to recreate that spirit, get the very similar style, probably create it better. We've got some real good distilling talent in the in the business. So, you know, actually, if you think about it, consistency in whiskey is. I mean, there's those old arguments that oh, whiskey back then tastes better. I think what people forget is that whiskey back then went like that, really went yeah, like that, yeah, and no, now yeah. it goes like that pretty much. Yeah. So I think um, there was some pretty awful whiskeys, but there was some oh, absolute yeah. crackers. And I think generally the, 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 the diversity and consistency of Scotch single malt and, you know, most whiskeys that are produced now is second to none. So the consumer choice is huge. Yeah. I mean, that's just it. I used to always think it was crazy when people would talk about – the old days of whiskey. I go, you, you know, realize like the stills people used back then, the, you know, huh. the containers, the water filtration, all sorts of stuff. You yeah, should yeah. count your blessings. You live in the time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. No, hey, uh, really. just real quick, uh, just a little rundown of some of the folks who are watching you right now, Gordon. Uh -huh. You are an international star right now. Yeah, this Not is only like the most Julia international show ever. Yeah, Brad in Panama. Brad with his Panamanian whiskey. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, v -v 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 I've murdered your name in Russia. 
Um, Yachislav, I believe. Good, thank God for Lou. Um, Don, Don, I think Don is uh, local. I think he's a local boy here mm. in Chicago. Um, Manuel, Manuel from the Dominican Republic. Alex Chang from Philadelphia. Over in I the know Dominican Alex well. Republic. I know Alex well. I, I, uh, I, I, I did a tasting with him in November in Philly just before lockdown maybe and then i knew he was he's from taiwan obviously i think originally yeah. so yeah he's a good guy good no, loves his whiskey loves his rose bank which is great yes he does yeah and who else somebody else loved uh uh oh don loves the tom do uh yeah. yeah i would love some too uh gordo so no, yeah no, no, good. <laughs> just we'll want to send out samples it's a little late but yeah better late than never whatever <laughs> I'm sorry. No, we have, we've, been, we, we've been out of stock in the states. Has been a bit of a problem. So yeah, um, I'm out of stock right now. Don't worry, uh, I'll sort you so. out, Marty, uh, and you, Lou. <laughs> I'll sort you out. And you no, can give no. me your you can give me your unbiased opinion no. afterwards. I don't need to get your. Uh, I'll just yeah, wait till the next whiskey event. I'll see you at the next. Exactly. Event. Yeah, I'll pour you yeah. decent rams. Um, uh, Alex does want to know when does I'm I'm assuming he means the Rosebank Distillery. When does it open? To the public, to be... Oh, I think, firstly, it's all about when we get the spirits running. I think it means to me. When does it open? <laughs> I, I, it will be producing spirit in, hopefully, August slash September. Oh, okay. Okay. To the public, maybe the year after. All right, so we're talking 2023. Early, yeah, 20, there's no point in... You know, if, you, if you're going to complete a distillery in September... You're going to need a bit of time to build up. You're not going to open it in December, so you may as well wait to the next year. Yeah. yeah. You know, not many people are doing whiskey tours in December, so right. let's wait until 2023 and do it really well. So I think early 2023, but it will be confirmed. Plus, what would your what would your gift store sell? Well, that is a, a, that's a very hats, interesting shirts, point. Golf balls. I've never. Yeah, no. <laughs> Yeah, roses. Snowballs? Ro roses. <laughs> Ding roses. dongs and snowballs. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna Some have uh, we're gonna have people uh, pastries. No, look, I mean you will be able to get even more exclusive rose banks than that if you turn up to the distillery. Oh yeah, the other guys. Sure. Sure. But um um you know you we will have a selection of other things for people to buy, plus maybe some products from our other distilleries. So um why not? You know, why not? I mean, it's it's it, of course it's Rose Bank, but it's Ian McLeod Distillers as well, and you know not everybody is good in, in the market for a two and a half, three thousand dollar bottle of whiskey. So, hey, real quick, who is Ian McLeod? Who's Ian McLeod was a man. It's a business we bought. It's a business. So actually, the business was only renamed Ian McLeod in the sixties. It's a business that um, we bought actually in the nineteen sixties, which was the which was the owner of the brand Isle of Sky. Oh, and oh. we we stuck with that name, so that name became the business Ian McLeod in 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 the sixties. And and Ian McLeod started off. And it's a great story. It started off as brokers in the Scotch whiskey industry. So for those people who maybe don't know, the amount I mean, you guys all know the amount of Scotch that moves round the industry between <laughs> Diageo and Perno and all these people is huge. And it's like you know all done on gentlemen's agreements and probably contracts now, but. You know, all done in the spirit of the way it should be done, and um, but but what was interesting was back then in the 30s and 40s and 50s is that they didn't want to be seen to be doing business with each other, so they used a broker uh, wow. as they as they still sort yeah. of do sometimes. So that so we were that broker, Ian McLeod, or you know was that broker. The Russell family were initially that those brokers, and then as a result, got these beautiful great contacts within the industry, and then. In the sort of 60s, 70s, they became blenders and started to blend whiskey and bottlers later on and then started to produce whiskeys for supermarkets. So in the UK, there's a supermarket called Sainsbury's used to start making their own label whiskey. Um, and, um, and then really, you know, so if you think that's from 1933, 70 years later, they bought Glen Goyne, their first whiskey distillery. Wow. So 70 years they've been in this industry without owning a whiskey distillery. They then bought they bought Glen Goyne, then they bought Tamdu in 2011, they bought Enbridge in 2016, and they built uh, and they're building Rosebank as of now. 
So it sounds like so, they're building it right now. Is that at your place, oh, Lou? That's, yeah. that's at my place. Yeah. yeah. Oh right, no, it's like. <laughs> yeah, the pipes I'm talking about are actually are frozen pipes in the house. So <laughs> oh really? Is it that cold, cold yeah. there? Is it that cold? Uh, not today, but uh, yeah, it's been it, been quite cold. You're gonna probably get what we got, Lou. It's cold over here. In oh Chicago. yeah, it's supposed to be colder than hell tomorrow. Yeah, it's coming your way, yeah. baby. Yep. Hey everybody, we gotta go. Um, uh, Gordon. Thank you very much. Well, it's been everybody. a pleasure to chat. Gordon. It's we'll really good to see you both. Soon. Hey, everybody, just so you know, this is my last show with a sip of knowledge. I uh, appreciate my time, my last uh, two years, almost two years, close to two Wow, years. congratulations. 21 months. Yeah. Uh, it's been, uh, it was my, uh, 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 it was a, uh, a sentence. It was a public service sentence I had to do. Uh, work release program um, that uh, I was sentenced to. And um, uh, I'm going to miss little Lou and uh, Liz on a weekly basis. <laughs> I don't know about Liz. I think we've we've lost Liz. Lost Liz today. And connection. Um, but uh, I believe uh, Lou and Liz will be back next week. Certainly uh, hope with, to. Yeah, uh, with a, a new guest uh, that will be posted. Um, uh, should be the uh, the folks from Old Line Spirits in Baltimore. There you go, Baltimore, yeah. everybody. Baltimore, nice. the Baltimore. old Raven, the Wire, uh, the Ravens. What the? What do you call the? Uh, what's uh, uh, the? The team? Nevermore. The oh, Nevermore oh, oh, City. Right, 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 right. Yeah. The Edgar Allan Poe. That uh, that Baltimore. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, so uh, everybody, drink up, little Gordon. You be uh, safe over there. I don't trust oh, you. You'd be safe too. Good to see you both. And Liz, and good to see you too. <laughs> Marty, Marty, thanks for everything. You're welcome. Yeah, well Lou. done, Marty. Congratulations. Good luck with the next the next yeah, thing. You're always up to something, my friend. <laughs> Take care. Good glasses. Spend more glasses. time fighting crime. All right. Bye, kids. Take care. Bye, Thank you. Bye. <laughs>